pleasure to be here and to see so many people. Thanks to all of you for coming out. I hope it wasn't because you're in the world in the near future. <laughs> um, but we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you have seen the title. Uh, this is a somewhat abbreviated version. But it's here to emphasize that we are dealing now with a group of very small near-Earth asteroids which provide both dangers and opportunities. And let me just summarize by asking, why should we care about the small NEAs, the sub-kilometer near-Earth asteroids? Well, in terms of science, they are an unexplored component of the solar system. They're very hard to study telescopically because they're so faint. Only one spacecraft, the Japanese Hayabusa mission, has gone to one. And there are many interesting scientific questions about what this population of objects is. In exploration, they are the logical stepping stones to Mars. I like to be able to say stepping stones because these are, in fact, rocks. Uh, and uh, President Obama has committed NASA, at least in current terms of current plans, uh, to have its next major thrust in human exploration be missions to near-Earth asteroids. The defense issue is one that has driven much of the study of these objects for 20 years because they do hit the Earth. Uh, the most likely collisions with external objects are with small NEAs. And if we want to include defense of our planet within our scientific and technical uh, efforts, then we look to the smallest because they are the most frequent impactors. If we ever have a robust space economy, then these objects are the most accessible and therefore the logical source for all kinds of materials if we ever get to the point of asteroid mining. Politically, they have become increasingly important. Uh, the president has stated his interest, as I say, in having human exploration to them. The Congress has been supporting for 20 years, particularly in the defense context. The National Research Council has carried out two studies of near-Earth asteroids in the last couple of years. And it is an issue that the public is very aware of especially the impact issue. When we start, when I started working on this, it was a kind of, you know, we call it the giggle factor. Nobody believed it was real. Now, it is everywhere. The most recent example I heard was a couple of days ago, a commentator comparing the attitude of some members of the Congress toward global warming to the, the dinosaurs' treatment of the asteroid problem. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, quite specifically, the President's Office of Science and Technology Policy 
has just a few months ago assigned formal responsibility to NASA for the aspects of discovery, orbit calculation, and threat assessment of possible impacts. I'm going to go through quite a bit of material. I'm going to start with, with things that uh, I actually was using 10 years ago in these talks and move then into more recent issues. First, let me just point out to you what these objects look like. Uh, Eros is the largest of the near Earth asteroids with a diameter a length of about 30 kilometers. Uh, it's irregular, cratered, gives the impression it might have been broken apart and come back together again. This is the smallest one that's been visited, Hayabusa, which is about six or seven hundred meters long. Uh, you might notice there are no craters, instead there is positive relief features. It's a, <coughs> extremely different looking, but again it gives you the impression that it may have been broken apart and re, re accreted And then part of the long-standing interest of the public, particularly, in asteroid impacts is what happened on June 30th of 1908 in Russian Siberia on the Tunguska River, something I'm sure all familiar with. This thing came out of the sky about 9 in the morning uh, in a very low population area, but it was seen by several small towns along the Trans-Siberian Railroad. They saw it go off into the north, and there was an explosion. Uh, we don't know if anyone was actually killed by it, uh, but it devastated a thousand square kilometers of forest and has been clearly identified as an airburst from a stony object, a, co a cosmic collision in which the object exploded in the atmosphere five or ten kilometers up and, uh, and produced devastation equivalent to an airburst of a 10 megaton nuclear bomb. Now that did happen. It's real. It's documented. It's not that it could happen or it might happen or astronomers look out there and say maybe it will happen. It did. And so that gives a certain reality to the whole issue. The other thing that, that increased interest uh, is, of course, the discovery that the dinosaurs went extinct as a result of an impact. And that was a profound effect on science and on public conception. Partly as a result of that interest in the end Cretaceous impact that did in the dinosaurs, the Congress took the initiative back in 1991, 20 years ago, uh, with a statement that I think still holds very well. It says that it's imperative that the detection rate of these objects be increased, that the means to destroy or alter the orbits of asteroids that they threaten collisions should be defined. It's an international problem and noting that though the chances of the Earth being struck by a large asteroid, or any kind of asteroid, are very small, that uh, the committee believes the consequences of such a collision are so large that it's only prudent to assess the nature of the threat and prepare the field. As Tom said, I chaired the first NASA study, which was a direct result of this statement in the NASA Authorization Bill in 1991, and, uh, and we looked at trying to quantify the nature of the threat and begin to think about what we could do if we did find an asteroid on an impact uh, trajectory. Um, I now skip over almost 20 years of back and forth between the Congress and NASA. Uh, the key thing, having been due in part to Carl Pilcher, who was the head of the NASA planetary program at the time, and that is to bring the congressional interest and the NASA interest together and formalize a NASA program to detect, to survey near Earth asteroids. And that was in 1998. And uh, I remember Carl telling the Congress that after only eight years, uh, NASA was now going to do what they'd been wanting us to do back in uh, about 1990. Now, skipping ahead, there have been a variety of studies. And a number of them have said that we should not only look for the one kilometer or larger asteroids, which is what the, was the initial interest, but smaller ones as well. And again, things didn't always move as quickly as some would have liked. In 2008, the Congress reaffirmed its policy direction to NASA to detect, track, catalog, and characterize physical characteristics of near Earth objects, now going to smaller sizes, down to 140 meters. And that we needed a comprehensive program in order to make technical and policy decisions, and saying that a federal agency should be responsible. And as I mentioned a few slides back, 
Uh, one of the things that happened this last year was that that, that responsibility was formally assigned to NASA. Now, I'm going to talk about several ways of looking at the impact hazard. I'm starting with the hazard because that's where most of the interest has been over the last 20 years. Not asteroids as good guys, not asteroids as friends, but asteroids as enemies. Um, and the initial approach that NASA sponsored and most everyone went along with was what I might call a scientific approach. We must understand the problem. We must understand what these objects are like, what their orbits are, what the probabilities of impacts are, and in some sense to, to distribute the understanding of risk over different size objects. Um, and that is something, as all scientists know, that can be done by sampling. You don't have to measure every one of thousands upon thousands of asteroids to estimate populations and impact frequencies. So all the initial work really was trying to, to scope out the problem, do statistical studies, to provide a tool to analyze how things would work. But I want to comment that while this is great as a scientific approach, and was a necessary first step, <coughs> learning about the average statistical frequency does not in itself reduce the hazard. It doesn't lead us to a mitigation or defensive problem. It's merely the essential first step to understand what's happening. It led to this graph, which has been refined over and over, and now has lots of data in it instead of just a straight line drawn on PowerPoint. But this still gives you the overall feel for what the frequency is of impacts on Earth of objects of different size. Here I'm using objects of different size, not by measuring their diameters in meters, but their energy in megatons, the standard unit used in the nuclear world, for instance, a million tons of TNT. And so it's the TNT equivalent yield across the bottom and the average frequency of impacts over the whole Earth. On the, uh, the extreme right, you see KT, that's the end Cretaceous extinction event. Um, that is estimated roughly 100 million megatons, that is 100 million million tons of TNT, and is expected to happen once every 100 million years or so. Um, one of the things I worked a lot on was trying to determine the threshold where an impact's consequences are global and not just local where it doesn't matter to first order where the impact takes place. The whole world is impacted, using the word in a different way. And we call that a global ta catastrophe, and uh, papers I wrote back in 1993 and 1994 estimated that, uh, that that should happen about once every couple million years. Then you see the Tunguska explosion there, the one that's equivalent to a 10 megaton nuclear bomb. And that should happen about once a millennium. <coughs> Again, not grossly inconsistent with the fact that we observed it once. The thing that discombobulated us at first was the far left, Hiroshima. That says an impact <coughs> with the energy of the Hiroshima bomb, about 15 kilotons, should take place every year. And when we first analyzed this, uh, our Chapman and I, we had what many of you know sometimes call an oh shit moment when you say I must have done something wrong because surely if there were an impact the size of, the, uh, of an atom bomb on earth every year we'd know about it. <laughs> so were we off by three orders of magnitude somehow in our estimate or what? Uh, the answer turned out to be much simpler and more gratifying. Those impacts do take place but they're not impacts on the surface. Those objects burn up or explode at high altitude. And once we had access to the Defense Department's <coughs> surveillance system, the down-looking satellites that are constantly monitoring the whole atmosphere of the Earth, we found that, in fact, this is just about the right frequency. That is the one point on here that's actually anchored with real measurements, that every year we observe these, and we can tell you every year what the largest one is, and it does come out to about a 10 megaton object once a year. That is an assessment of the 
Yes. It tells you roughly how often impacts take place by what size objects. And it ties it to consequences on the ground, a Tunguska object that would be like a 10 megaton explosion, the global catastrophe that would wreck civilization, the KT impact that would lead to a mass extinction. And each of those now is tied quantitatively, but approximately. Nothing I have here is good to better than a factor of two or even three. And there are lots of differences. This ignores the fact that asteroids are made of different materials. It, uh, it's a smooth, average approach. But it's good enough to compare with other more familiar. It says that the statistical risk of death for any individual is about one in four million per year, or one in 50,000 lifetime risk. Turns out to be not so different from the, the risk of some natural catastrophes, such as earthquakes or major storms. It's uh, <laughs> On an average basis, then, it's like other things we deal with. But on average isn't the right way to look at it, because the severity of the individual disasters, and millions or billions of people killed, is greater than any other known natural hazard. Um, and the interval is very long. In other words, we're dealing with an average risk, but the packaging is different. He will go for hundreds of thousands or millions of years without killing anyone, and then have one mega catastrophe. That led to the giggle factor, because who's going to believe the scientists when they talk about things like that? They want real information. It, it's an overemphasis, perhaps, on statistics. And as a scientist, I think statistics are fine. I think what we did was fine. But the hazard that concerns most people is the next one, the impact that will happen in the next few centuries. And that's not a statistical issue anymore, that's quite deterministic. Because except in Hollywood movies, uh, asteroids don't capriciously change orbit and suddenly head to the Earth. Uh, you know, it's a, Newton's laws work, it's a fixed system. Any object that's going to hit us will come by every so often for thousands of years beforehand. And so, um, we do have a possibility of not taking just a statistical approach, but of actually surveying individual objects. Not averages, but individual objects to find the next one. If we look, we can provide warning. If we don't carry out a survey, then we're like the, like the dinosaurs, and we have little, if any, warning of what's happening. So this leads to a second approach to surveys with emphasis not on statistics anymore. We're actually going to try to survey everything, but we're going to have the emphasis <coughs> on the most dangerous objects, the ones that provide the greatest total risk to the planet. One of the things that, that we demonstrated early on was that the, the key area of high risk is for objects <laughs> one to three kilometers in diameter, because they produce global consequences. So we should carry out a survey that starts looking for the bigger objects, especially those in the one to three kilometer range. And isn't that convenient, because those are the bigger ones which telescopes can easily find. Some people have questioned the motivation of astronomers, who conveniently found out that the highest priority objects were the ones that was easier for them to detect. But that's actually the way it worked out. And so when, when Carl Pilcher and others established the Space Guard goal, the Space Guard survey, it was set at we will find 90% of the near-Earth asteroids larger than one kilometer. And uh, see if there's anything out there that actually has our name on it. And since then, as that survey has been very successful, uh, there's been much discussion of going to deeper surveys with bigger telescopes. Ironically, it costs more to find the small ones than the big ones, and therefore, as you eliminate the risk from the big ones, and the more much than the small ones, the costs go up. And so you ask in each, at each level, you know, the cost effectiveness of this. Is it worth, it's probably worth spending $4 million a year to look for those big enough to produce a global catastrophe. Is it worth spending $400 million a year uh, to look for Tunguska-sized objects? These many policy issues that are raised. 
But we did start the space card survey, uh, aimed at asteroids one kilometer or larger. And it turned out, although there were many participants initially, in the end, just four small one meter telescopes with really good teams and really good detectors have done almost all of the successful surveys. The goal was to find 90% of the NEAs larger than one kilometer. Um, within 10 years of the start of the survey, we didn't quite make it, but we are there now. And here is a graph showing the history of the space car discoveries. There's some interesting points here. The, the blue is all near-Earth asteroids. The red is those larger than one kilometer. And the metric was in terms of those larger than one kilometer. But one thing you immediately notice is that we find many, many smaller than that threshold. <coughs> Roughly 80% of the <coughs> objects that are discovered are below the nominal threshold. Uh, the threshold corresponds to where we want completeness. The reality is, of course, that we don't, it's not, it's not like fishing, we don't throw back the small ones. If a small one happens to come through our telescope and be detected, we survey and add that too. Uh, so the great majority of the objects discovered in Space Guard are actually just one or two or three hundred meters across. You notice also that the two curves have a different shape, and that's just what you'd expect. One of the things that came out of statistical studies was an effort to estimate the number of near-Earth asteroids capable of hitting the Earth uh, with a diameter larger than one kilometer. And there were some variations, of, but in the end we came down at about 900 of them, between 900 and 1,000. If you look at the red curve, you will see it's already up above 800. We're nearly done. And you'll notice another aspect of that. The curve rises fairly rapidly at first and then flattens off. It's exactly what you'd expect as you near completeness. Uh, looking at it another way, if you just do this the random search, which is the way it's done, uh, by the time you reach where we are now, you'll find 9 or 10 or 11 objects that are already in the catalog for every new one that comes along. And that's a way of assessing your progress. Uh, one other thing to mention is the inflection in 1998, where suddenly the rate of discovery goes up. That was the point at which I started funding this in a serious way. It shows what the money is. So, we've done, done the space card survey. It's still operating, it's still finding objects, but it's logical to look at the next step, and especially when we realize how many more small objects there are. The risk may be concentrated in the bigger ones, but the frequency of impacts is in the smaller ones. So, a lot of study has been done in the last five years about how you would do it. One way is to build a humongous big telescope on the ground. Happens to be coincident with the interest of much of the astrophysics community in building an eight meter survey telescope called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, LSST, at a site in Chile. Uh, which would find all these asteroids and almost anything else. It covers the entire sky every 10 days and goes down to a depth of like 25th magnitude. So every gamma ray burst, every variable star, every event that happens up there would be, you know, uh, the universe, the movie, available on your own screen at home. And, uh, and it's a tremendously powerful tool, and one of the things it would do is carry out this NDA survey. But it hasn't been built yet. It hasn't been fully funded yet, although it may be this year. So if we're interested in getting the survey done, we have to ask how long that's going to take. <coughs> It'll probably take five or six years to build the telescope. And then the time scale of discovery is defined primarily by the Earth approach interval for these objects. These are asteroids that have Earth-like orbits to some degree. And so they don't come by every year. Their so-called synodic period, the period between successive oppositions, is four, five, six years, and you'll miss some of them. Some will come by on the day side instead of the night side. So there's a natural time scale, no matter how big your telescope or how many you have, of about a decade to get a 90% the alternative is to do the survey from space. If the space telescope is just outside the Earth's atmosphere, it has no advantage, really. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but if you put the space telescope on Venus, no, let's not put it on Venus. That's not such a good idea. Let's put it in a Venus-like orbit. Then it's circulating around the solar system with respect to the Earth, and it can complete the whole survey in about a third of the time. So there is obvious interest from NASA, and especially, of building a space-based system, putting it near the Venus orbit, and using that to get the survey. Um, my last comment here is just what I've been saying before, but it's interesting how long it took before people realize it. Any survey will find more objects below the nominal limit than above. And it's especially true in a most unfortunate NASA study of the 140 meter size, in which they had to get a lot of good analysis of what it would take to find the survey. And then when they came to what you do with the data, they only considered what you would do with an object 140 meters across. They totally ignored the fact that 80 to 90 percent of what this will discover are smaller than that limit. Then there is another perspective which people are struggling with. The previous approach was to do as complete a survey as possible, to look for what's out there and calculate the orbits for every one of them. But meanwhile, while you're struggling to get all the 300 meter objects or all the 200 meter objects, we're likely to get hit by something smaller. So the alternative now is to say, oh, we aren't really trying to do this big survey and find out things that are going to hit 100 or 200 years from now. Let's do some sort of local survey and just look at the space around the Earth and try to give ourselves a few days warning of a smaller object. In other words, deal directly with the public concerns of can we detect the next impact. Because it's logical to ask that. Astronomers get up and give all these spiels about the deep surveys and complete studies and all that. And then they say, well, can you find the next object like Tunguska? They say, no, no, we aren't up to doing that. Well, this all came to a focus of Peter Jenniskins and others here in Italy in uh, October 2008 with the chance discovery of an object, 2008 TC3, which was discovered just 36 hours before it hit. And it's a small object, it was a wonderful piece of science, it was observed telescopically during those 36 hours. So we got the remote sensor, it came in over the Sudan, Peter led the team, just heroic, a lot of students from Harkin uh, University that picked up the pieces of it, and uh, for the first time we have in our hands uh, chunks of an object that we actually saw in space before it hit. So that demonstrates a capability, perhaps, that you could optimize a system for looking at objects close to Earth. Um, I should mention parenthetically that your telescope, you've been a Venus type orbit, can't do that because it's a long way from Earth, so it doesn't have that advantage of looking for faint objects when they're very close to us. Um, and maybe you can do both. Maybe you can optimize a system for both, or maybe you build two different systems. There was a lot of interest a couple years ago in going for these small objects with just a little bit of warning. And I think it was overdone. The big question is still the complete surveys. And my analogy was if you're faced with both a cloud of mosquitoes and a venomous snake, you may be tempted just to slot the mosquitoes, but you ignore the snake in your peril. In other words, you may be only looking for these little objects, most of which are exposed in the atmosphere, and overlook the survey for something that could really do serious harm to our planet. Well, why would we do the surveys? Well, when you come right down to it, you, if you, it's to, to defend against them. If we find one that's going to hit, what are we going to do? And the idea is to, uh, to deflect it to change its orbit, probably not to blow it up, uh, although that's a possibility, but to change its orbit just a little bit. Think about the situation. You're extrapolating forward in time. You've calculated that a impact will occur 20 years from now, exact date and time. What that means is as the Earth and the asteroid are both going around the sun, several orbits from now, they're going to be at the same place at the same time. If you want to avoid the impact, you can either slow down or speed up the Earth, or slow down or speed up the asteroid. Pretty obvious that you would do 
All you have to do is, it, the, the Earth goes its own diameter in about six or seven minutes. So all you would have to do is either retard the asteroid by six or seven minutes, or speed it up a little, and it'll miss. And that's the point of deflection. To change the asteroid's orbital period just enough that by the time the danger zone happens, when you thought a collision would take place, it'll be a little bit ahead or a little bit behind and pass the Earth harmlessly. If we had an object bigger than 100 meters that we found, we'd probably pull out all the stops. Because that's, that's big. That's bigger than Tunguska by quite a lot. And we just wouldn't want to have that happen. If it's smaller than 100 meters, you might stop and say, well, you know, we, do we want a $10 billion crash program to deflect it? Maybe we should think, first of all, where it's going to hit. And if it's going to hit in the ocean, it won't do much harm to anybody. If it hit in Siberia, if it hit in Tunguska, and no more people living in Tunguska now than there were a century ago. You know, you just take the hit, perhaps. Uh, but if it's headed for populated areas, then it would be different. Uh, most, the easiest way to do a deflection is with a ballistic impact. You simply hit the asteroid with a rocket to either slow it down or speed it up in its orbit. And if once is enough, you do it over and over. You don't try to break it apart. You just try to change its momentum. Um, and again, for sizes like 100 or 200 meters, we can do that with just with the rockets we have now. We haven't developed the technology that we could. But then you ask, well, what is the most likely? It's not that we'll find an object two or 300 meters in diameter that's going to hit. Most likely impact event in the next decade or two will actually be a false alarm. Someone will find an asteroid on what looks like it may be an impact trajectory. Once the press catches on, even though they scientists may say it's only a 1% or a 10% chance of hitting, you know it's going to be on the headlines. And we're going to have to deal with this issue with the public and with other countries, with lots of things of how you deal, of how you respond to a warning that actually statistically has a very low probability of happening. Not an easy thing to do. Actually, the next most likely is a strike without warning of any sort. Again, it's a fairly small object, say a Tunguska type object. And suddenly there's this explosion. Everybody will be running around. Uh, one of the issues that's often been raised is, is does that enhance the risk of nuclear war? Well, if such an explosion without any prediction took place in an area like the Indian Pakistani border, you know, who knows how people would respond. Uh, so these are all cases where you, you need to plan, and if you're really dealing with the possibility of something hitting the ground uh, without warning, no, no defense, no deflection, no mitigation, you turn it over to the disaster relief people, just like you would after the Haiti earthquake. So there's a whole spectrum of possibilities here. Uh, certainly, it's an international issue. <clears throat> All parts of the Earth are equally likely, a priori, to be hit. More than half of the hits will be in international waters, where there will be shipping from many countries, where there may be islands, where there are tsunami possibilities. And the impact damage may extend over several countries. So this is not, this is something that if you're going to be serious about, you have to work through international organizations. This has happened in the last three years. Uh, the Association of Space Explorers, which is made up of all the astronauts and cosmonauts, everyone who's flown in space, has catalyzed and worked with the UN on an international program to start talking about how we would respond. And uh, you can go on the, the web and get that. So, I've talked a lot about impacts as a danger, because that's what comes to people's mind first, and a lot of thought has been given to on how to do it. Let's go on now and talk about other issues. The good guys. Now asteroids are, <coughs> are no longer a threat. They are an opportunity. They are the stepping stones to Mars. They are the way we develop a capability to go beyond lunar orbit. And in last May at KSC, President Obama formally 
committed the U.S. that the next goal for human flight beyond low Earth orbit will be to a near Earth asteroid by 2025. Some of us were a little shocked because we don't know of much of any asteroid that's available before 2025. <laughs> we're talking about small objects. Because they have to be in the right place in the right time. And, well, let me just say that I was very interested in the comment that the Administrator Bolden made in August. And I think this is a direct quote. He probably doesn't want me to use it, but I was sitting there listening. He says, the President gets it about NEOs. His main priorities for NASA are about education, international cooperation, and planetary defense. I don't think that's the official NASA line, but that is what, how Mr. Bolden interpreted the president's personal interest in space. <coughs> so you have to find any eight targets, initial targets, that have very little energy, short flight time, don't require a big rocket, don't produce excessive risk for astronauts by long exposure in space. So typically you would talk about a mission of less than six months duration. Maybe as little as three or four, if you, in which you have to get out there, stay a little while, and come back. Not, not a real easy thing to do. Um, you find we have very few asteroids that we've discovered that, that have those kinds of orbits. And some of them are really small. What do you think is the minimum size for a suitable target to catch the public imagination when we go there? I would say, for instance, probably the asteroid should be larger than the spacecraft. <laughs> um, well, you remember, 100 meters is about the size of the International Space Station. So, you know, you don't want to go to a 10 meter object. Uh, and again, there are very few known. Now, think about the, the launch experience. We all know that the U.S. does not have a fantastic record of launching every spacecraft on time. Uh, and especially when you're dealing with a new space path, and especially when you're dealing with humans on board. So you always have fallbacks. If you were going to the moon, you'd just slip the launch by one month, and the moon's back there again. Not so here. You miss a launch for one of these objects with a long somatic period, it'll probably be five years before it's back. So you need to have a cue. You need to have, well, if we miss this launch, there's another one coming along in three months, and we can go to it instead. How many do you need in that queue? What, what strategy do you have to buffer against inevitable launch delay? And then if you even discover a queue of objects, what shall we say? One, over five years, four a year, 20 objects, any one of which could be the one for the first human flight. And you want to do some precursor studies to, to get there before the astronauts do. Does that mean you're going to have to fly 20 precursor missions in order to prepare the one that will be there when the launch vehicle is ready? What would a precursor mission do? What is the we need to know about these small asteroids for human visits or science or any other purpose? Well, first, we have to know its orbit well. These objects are so small they cannot be tracked continuously. They only can be seen with telescopes when they're relatively close to the Earth. And so you have to know where it will be, whether you're worried about an impact for defense are you worried about a target for human space flights? And uh, that's something that needs working on, especially because of the thing called the Yarkovsky effect. Some of you have heard of, I won't go into detail, but what it basically does is say that depending on the speed of rotation, the axis of rotation, and the detailed configuration of the surface, absorbed sunlight will be asymmetrically re-radiated in the infrared. And that asymmetric radiation will change the orbit of the asteroid. But it depends on knowing its spin rate, its shape, its surface topography, its thermal inertia of the surface. It's actually one of the hardest things to determine uh, empirically, and yet that's what you need to know. Obviously, if you're going to do a characterization mission, you need to know its basic physical properties, size, shape, mass, density, spin vector. Surface composition is very interesting. What do visible and infrared spectral maps tell you? What is the thermal inertia? Um, is there an interaction between dust on the surface and the solar plasma? Um, the astronauts, you know, first their question is, uh, 
Can we leave a footprint there? So the answer is no. I mean, if you put your footprint down, you will go off in the other direction. Um, and these guys are really small. The analogy is more like working around the International Space Station. I point this out. Don't think moon. Don't think boots on the ground. Don't think that. Think about working at the space station. And the JSC people answered, yes, the space station has handholds, which is true. Uh, and internal structure. Certainly interesting if, you, uh, if you're talking about defense. You may want to know whether it's a monolithic piece of rock, a rubble file, or whatever. Now, in terms of the overall survey, you get some characterization almost for free when you find them in the telescopes. If you track them over time, you see that they get brighter and dimmer, brighter and dimmer as the object rotates. The amplitude of that tells you something about the maximum and minimum dimensions. Uh, you can put infrared spectrometers on large telescopes. It takes the largest in the world for these little guys and determines something about their composition. In a few cases, they will come close enough to be within range of the planetary radars at Arecibo or at Goldstone. And that's very powerful. But those aren't necessarily the ones that interest you. If you say, we're really interested just in the ones that will be uh, available for a human flight between uh, 2025 and 2030, chances are none of those is going to come close enough for radar. There have been a lot of argument about other things. What about flybys? In our past reconnaissance of the solar system, we always start with the flyby, right? And then you go to orbiters and so on. We just naturally think flybys are going to give us a good first look. Now, the spacecraft will approach and pass one of these asteroids at a speed of typically of the order of five kilometers a second. If it's 100 meters across, how long does it take the spacecraft to pass it? <laughs> Much less than one second. <laughs> and can you measure its mass that way? No, not enough to deflect the spacecraft. You get a snapshot, or two or three. And uh, it's taken a while for some people to realize also that our experience with past missions isn't necessarily the right thing. What we need to do is rendezvous. Now, some people would have said, what we need to do is orbit the object. But these things are so small you can't even go into a stable orbit. You simply fly in formation and station key. But you do have to match the orbit and stay there. Ames has been studying various low-cost rendezvous missions to sub-kilometer asteroids for four or five years now. It can be simple instruments. What you're doing, in effect, by staying a long time <coughs> is milking the instrument you have. And just cameras and a LIDAR and a spectrometer can get you a lot of data if you stay there a long time and maneuver around the object. Vesta is the second largest main belt asteroid. Matilda was a flyby and one of the first in which we succeeded in measuring a mass. The uh, near Shoemaker mission did, went there. The near Shoemaker spacecraft that orbited Eros. And if you can barely see that little dot, that's Itakawa, the target of the Japanese mission. We used Apophis as an example. How big is Apophis? Well, you've all seen Hangar 1 at Ames. That's the size of Apophis. Imagine extending it under the ground, making a three-dimensional object out of it. That's how big it is. That's a target. Uh, then imagine from the point of view of an instrument. You're sitting at the Ames main gate. You don't have a badge, and the <laughs> place won't let you in. So you get out your telescope at the main gate, which is roughly a kilometer from, from there, and you try to study it and see if you can find the bolts on the surface. Hmm. That's analogous to what you would be doing with an asteroid the size of Apophis and a spacecraft about a kilometer away. The measurement strategy is fairly straightforward. You need LIDAR, and very careful tracking of the spacecraft from Earth in order to determine the mass of the object and its orbit. The mass is going to detect the spacecraft only very slightly. You won't be able to go into orbit around it. So that's not easy. You have to get the size, the dimensions, all these things by remote sensing, 
just at distances of 500 meters or a kilometer or two kilometers from it. You have to use a strategy such that when something goes wrong, as almost always happens, and the spacecraft goes into a safe mode, it doesn't hit it. So you never really hover. You drift back slowly, taking data. So if suddenly you lose control, your spacecraft's going to keep on going and not hit the surface. But don't want to keep it going too fast, because if you recover a week later, and you're way, way, way far away, then that's not so good either. Um, but you can make these kinds of measurements uh, with a fairly intensive science survey approach and, uh, and determine essentially everything you need to know. Maybe not internal structure. Now, I haven't said what these characterization missions are for, but that's what's interesting to me. When I was going to have these slides, I thought, well, I'll make one list of what you need to know for human targets, one list of what you need to know for defense, one list of what you need to know for science, and they all turned out the same. Which is good. Except when people at NASA headquarters begin to consider who's really in charge of this mission. But we won't go there. <laughs> we don't know what the surfaces will look like. We're talking about objects that are smaller than any we've ever been to. Let me just talk about mass for us. Eros, the largest near-Earth asteroid, the one that we have been to, orbited and even landed on the surface. Compare it to our moon. Apophis, it is a million times smaller than the moon in mass. Apophis is a million times smaller than Eros. And some of the targets suggested for human visits are a hundred times smaller than that in mass. They are very little, very different kinds of objects. Since the asteroids are not all identical, we're very motivated to do missions to multiple asteroids. And there have been several strategies for that. JPL has an approach, which is kind of nice. They, they package together four or five or six individual spacecraft with electric propulsion. They launch them all in a cluster, and they separate. They each go off in their individual direction and fly to the asteroid targets and rendezvous them. We've looked at sequential. You launch one spacecraft, but take a lot of fuel. You go to one asteroid, spend six months there, then you go to another one, maybe eventually to a third. We've looked at doing this within the context of NASA's discovery program, which is $400 million missions. Uh, we've also looked at how to do it much less expensively with a very small spacecraft, like the LCROSS spacecraft we sent to the moon, that piggybacks its launch doesn't even require a separate launch vehicle. All of these are possible modes. They all end up making the same kind of measurements, the same objectives. But so far, there has been absolutely no approval of any one of these missions or any one of these approaches. And we all have 2025 looming as the time when we are supposed to be ready to go to a near Earth asteroid with our astronauts. The mission that I've been working on, called the Multiple Asteroid Explorer, is now in as a discovery proposal, uh, one of several near-Earth asteroid discovery proposals. Um, and I'm not going to go through it in any detail, just say it's, it's, a, it's a very robust, solid design that uses a all aerospace spacecraft and, uh, and really state-of-the-art instruments, as opposed to the things that are are based on smaller spacecraft and smaller instruments. I don't know which is the best way to go. You play the politics as well as the technical possibilities. But I think we will go. We are compelled to go. We are going to be interested in these darn little things that aren't much bigger than this building. We're going to send humans to them. What are humans going to do there? Don't ask me. <laughs> but they're going. We're going to therefore send the cursor missions if I know what they're going to do. Sometime within the lifetimes of most people in this room, we're going to have a serious issue of a warning of one of these going to hit the Earth. And we're going to have to know what to do, how to design a defense mission, or whether to evacuate the area where it might hit, or how to deal with it. They aren't going away. Um, and maybe, generations from now, their resources will be the key to a robust, self-sustaining architecture in space. 
for all the energy and intellectual energy and money and effort we spend in solar system exploration. It's these tiny guys that come close to the Earth that offer us today some of our biggest challenges. And I thank you for the opportunity to talk about it. what we have or what we would like to have. <laughs> what we have now is $4 million a year for the Space Guard Survey. The budget the President proposed increased that to $20 million for surveys. And if one of these missions, like a Discovery mission, is approved, that's going to be like $100 million a year. So these are huge increases, but some of them can be dealt with within existing programs like Discovery. I don't know what it will take. We just, I'm more concerned that we get started, that we get the first spacecraft out there and start to look at these. And then if you're asking me how much it will cost to send a human there, I'm not even going to think about that. Hey, Dave. Yeah. Um, you mentioned it was both an advantage and disadvantage to have the same measurement goals for uh, human exploration, hazard, and science. How do you turn that into a, a win factor when you make a, a discovery proposal that might be focused on just the science while what you're doing can have many benefits in other areas like potential space resources or exploration? It seems like there's no one silver bullet call for proposals that addresses this. You're not suggesting that there are parochial interests in NASA. Uh, I've never seen it before. But, uh, <laughs> but yes, that terrible frustration. So you write a proposal to the space science area. Can you even mention that this also helps protect the Earth from, from impacts? Can you write a proposal to the, uh, the human exploration people? Can you mention that there's some science value in it? It's not clear. <laughs> Just a question of defense. If a collision course were uh, observed now, what, statistically speaking, how, how Let's see. Could we get it? Could we defend ourselves today from the technology standpoint? If we were given a 30-year warning, I think we could. <laughs> we have not, in fact, tested any of this technology. It's fairly simple. It's Newton's laws. You know, and we can build rockets, and we did send a rocket that impacted with, uh, with a comet, a deep impact mission. These things can be done. But there's been no specific technology development, and one of the things you always run into if you're interested in defense only is why should we spend any money on this until we've identified a target? You know, an unreal case. Should there be precursor money? Should we study the asteroids that we can get to easily, for instance, and somehow assume that what we learn about them will apply to the one that picked us? And I don't know the answer to that. I think if we're given 30 or 40 years, there's time to actually develop the politics and the technology. If we were given one year warning, there's absolutely nothing we could do. If we were given 10 years, we could probably deflect it if we had already done the technology testing. And then there are those who would like to nuke them. And there may be circumstances where that's the right thing to do. But does anyone think we will ever be allowed to test a <laughs> nuclear system? I worry that, that we wouldn't ever be allowed to until you know, we were faced with the real problem. Hi there. I was just wondering, um, in parallel with the scientific and technical preparations that you've listed off to get us or get humans to near Earth objects um, or asteroids, for that matter, what, in your opinion, are some things that should be done right now to prepare humans in general, whether or not it's operationally or training the astronauts or so forth, uh, to get ready for this for this voyage? That's a good question, and I am not the one to answer it uh, because I've never worked on the human exploration side. Uh, I think that, uh, that we still don't really know what the humans will do when we get there. We understand how to protect them for several months in space. We talk about how many people we can send, three-man crew, four, three-person crew, excuse me, you know, how much resources we would need to take and all that. Uh, but during that week or two that they actually visit this asteroid, 
What will they really do? I don't know. Probably telling robotic they operate something that goes to the surface, as opposed to going to the surface themselves. But I don't know. There's a big psychological advantage in having an astronaut stand on the surface of the object and get their picture taken. <laughs> uh, can you say more about the multiple asteroid explorer mission length, the scope of it? And well, it, some of it's proprietary, and most of it would bore people, but I can say a little more. Uh, and, and those are sometimes the same things. Um, you know, th this is a mission that, uh, that is designed to, uh, to visit three asteroids. The first one, just a flyby, where we don't expect much data, but we can test the, uh, the system. The second one, a very small NEA, one about 90 meters in diameter, uh, which is way below what anything we've seen before. And maybe in the regime, where observational astronomers find that these objects rotate fast, and they must be monoliths. They rotate so fast that if they had loose material on, it would spin right off. And so spend about four months there, and then go to Apophis, and we're now you know, a 10-year-long mission, and, uh, and spend about six months there investigating with this, this suite of instruments. And in the case of Apophis, drop two small probes onto the surface. I say drop. Let me just talk about that. That goes interesting. <laughs> if you let a probe go, it wouldn't necessarily drop. The gravity is so small. So instead, you release it with a spring and push it there. It's now going to hit fast enough that it will bounce and may bounce right off again. You have to hit the, the in between. What is the speed at which a dropped object would actually approach the surface of, of Apophis? It's about the speed of a crawling baby. <laughs> we are not talking about the sort of thing we normally think of in spaceflight. We have to reorient our thinking toward what's there. When it bounces, how long does it take from the first bounce to the second? <laughs> about three hours. <laughs> no, it's, it's just a whole other world of slow motion, low gravity environment that, that we need to learn about. Okay, so if you all join me in uh, thanking Dave for his great